Hey everybody, Mary Fran Bontempo here. And before we get started with this week's episode, did you know that Brilliantly Resilient can come directly to you? That's right, we have keynotes, programs, presentations, workshops, all available to companies, associations, conferences, and organizations, either virtually or live in person. So head on over to BrilliantlyResilient.net at the Speaking tab to find out more. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our weekly Brilliance Bit, which comes to you once a week directly to your inbox and has a bit of brilliance from this week's show and will keep you living in a Brilliantly Resilient mindset. Okay, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. What's your train wreck? Everyone has one. The question is, are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Let's check in with Mary Fran and Kristen to learn how to come through not broken, but brilliant. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. I am your host, Mary Fran Bontempo. Um, Anybody who knows me knows that I am half Italian and food is like a thing for me. In fact, my husband always knows when I'm on the phone with my mother because our conversations generally end up talking about food. However, not everyone has that luxury. And today I have two folks with me who are going to talk about their work with the Warminster Food Bank. So I want to welcome Mike Serino and Melody Latare. Is it Latare, Melody? Latare. Latare, Latare. Latare. Okay, you'll answer to anything. You're kind of like, just yeah, whatever. Just call me. Call me. I'll answer. So anyway, thank you both for being here today. Mike, your title, are you executive director? I'm the uh, executive director of the Warminster Food Bank. Actually, this is a new title. I was director and I got promoted up to executive director, whatever that means. Oh, fancy. I still make a dollar a year, so <laughs> maybe maybe they'll make it $2. But, more uh, more yeah. words, no more money, no, just more responsibility. I'm overpaid, actually, I think. That's that's what happens when you're with a passion project. It's That's just right. the way it goes. And Melody, you've been volunteering with the organization for how long now? For just over a little bit of a year since January. Okay. So one of the things that I want to start off with here is that Warminster, for those folks who are not from this area, and we're just outside of Philadelphia, Warminster is a suburb of Philadelphia. Generally, when you think of suburbs of cities, you think of people who live in bigger houses, have their yards, have, you know, a a decent income, their kids are going to not private schools necessarily, but good public schools, all that kind of stuff. People don't necessarily think about food insecurity in places where there are big houses. So tell us a little bit about the fact that we have to kind of open our eyes to the community that you are serving. Well, first of all, you know what? Let me back up a little bit. Mike, can you define what food insecurity means? Because I think we get lost in words sometimes. What does that mean? Well, absolutely. And I appreciate you uh, using the phrase food insecurity. A lot of the um, pantries that are serving the same community use the word hunger. And I, and I think that's kind of hyperbole because here in southeastern Pennsylvania, when I think of hunger, I don't think of people starving to death. You know, I think of uh, it's not Somalia, it's southeastern Pennsylvania. But food insecurity is a specific condition that relates to choices that people have to make economically. Uh, The choice between uh, a prescription drug and buying food, the choice between buying gas or buying food, the choice between school supplies and buying food. You know, in in the post-COVID economy, as prices went up and went up and up, and up and up food insecurity has actually gotten worse it was bad during COVID, and it actually got worse and, and it's it's actually a hidden thing in the warmest food bank we're servicing three thousand families a year wow. so i wouldn't call that epidemic but i would call that a, a definitive need that that lies below the surface uh you know it's it's and this is the other point that i that i do want to make it lies below the surface most of us who live in the suburbs You know, we go about our lives and I don't want to say these people are hidden because the fact of the matter is 
your next door neighbor could be experiencing food insecurity. And, and we, we have to become more aware of the fact that, as you said, Mike, it's not necessarily hunger, but it's how am I going to make this choice? I mean, these are necessities of life. You need prescription drugs. You need your gas free car. You want your kid to have the food supplies. I mean, the school supplies, but when 3,000 families a year are having to make these difficult choices, we as a general community need to become more aware of that. So how do you make that happen? How do you show the rest of us, hey, you know, these people might be your next door neighbors? Well, we've done a lot of projects uh, to build awareness. You know, I'm one of the few agencies that actually hire a full-time publicist and a full-time um, web developer and social media manager. So we're constantly doing projects. We're constantly creating awareness because it's not, yeah, I agree with you. It's hidden is maybe not the right word, but we need to have the heart to realize that there's people there. And, and there's, um, there's a myth out there that I wanna dispel immediately. I mean, I'm getting real tired of people saying that people are showing up at the uh, food pantries in their expensive car. That's a tired old stereotype, you know, because quite frankly, I, just just three weeks ago, I had someone show up in an Escalade. You would think, wow, if someone has an Escalade, you know, why are they coming to the food pantry to get uh, a basket of food? And the, the truth of the matter was they were living in that Escalade. So when that Escalade becomes your house, it's, it's not all that impressive. It may be impressive as a vehicle, and, you know, it doesn't take very much today's in the cost of cars to spend 45000 You know, it's not a over-the-top car at $45,000 a year. So uh, I'm getting, you know, I've been involved in this for 30 years, and that stereotype is as old as I can remember. And uh, we want to dispel those kind of things because people, they don't know any any moment you can become food insecure. You know, uh, um I don't want to speak for Melody, but there's a, you know, she has a personal situation with a drug that she has to take that's, she can't take a statin and she'll tell her story, but um, it's, 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 it's right over the top as far as what the cost of that medicine is. And so all of a sudden you can be minding your own business, a medical emergency comes up and boom, you find yourself in a, in a difficult situation. Well, and I appreciate that because the other part of this that, and you guys talk about this a lot is we have to stop judging this as something that people should be ashamed of. We don't want that. Melody, you're shaking your head. So jump in here and tell me what that means to you. Um, I, I believe that the people are, are embarrassed and ashamed. And the more we talk about it and the more we keep awareness in our community, the more people feel comfortable to come to us. Um, Mike and I, I'm his, I'm his personal assistant. I volunteer three days a week as well for my own mental health to get out of my house, to get, out of my, to get out of my head. But what he said, like, it's awareness. The more we put it out there, the more I, myself, who retired from um, a very beautiful, wonderful career, too had to admit I needed help. I needed, was it food over medication? I take a Synthroid that keeps me alive every night. If I don't take it, I'm because they took my thyroid out uh, due to another medical situation. But I want to focus it on the food bank and food insecurities. All I can say is the more we open up, the more we talk about it, the more we talk about our own issues, our own problems, it makes other people around us not feel alone. And then they say, I need help or my neighbor needs help. And awareness, awareness, awareness is the biggest pusher. Mike and I go, uh, he speaks at new, uh, uh, businesses, at schools, at church congregations. There's no discrimination in anywhere we go. Um, it's what we do, and, but it all starts with the passion within ourselves. And uh, it's very important to everybody to know this, that go to a food bank, observe, watch what goes on and you're going to see people just like you there. And, and, you know, you couldn't have said it better because that goes back to the point that I was making earlier that these people are our neighbors. These people are, you know, are our, our friends. These people are the folks that you don't necessarily look at them. We have an image in our heads about what a food insecure person is. And unfortunately, 
as I said earlier, that image comes with a lot of judgment. Oh, you know, they're too lazy to get a job. They're this, they're that, you know, they're on welfare. It, 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 we should have learned. And I think we're still in the process of learning. Like COVID was the great equalizer. Anything can happen at any moment to make us all be on the same playing field. And we are, but I think to your point about awareness, um, we have to understand that this is not just a they problem. It's our problem because you're a very successful podcast entertainer. God forbid if something happens, you know, with your medical or something goes on in your life, you want to mentally health prepare yourself, let alone still try to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and others. And I believe in if we can continue talking about it and talking about it, the embarrassment and shame. Well, the stigma of it will somewhat go down and people will go out and volunteer and help themselves to help others. So I love that point. And Mike, I'm going to jump back to you here, because one of the things that it does say on your website is it's easy to donate food. It's not so as easy to preserve dignity and respect and, and all of that when you're dealing with with folks who are in this situation. So you, when, you know, I always send out my little form with Brilliantly Resilient and ask folks what they want to talk about. And you actually had three points, Mike, vision, mission, and passion. So I want to talk a little bit about each one of those. So start with the vision here, Mike. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'm not going to take full credit for that because, uh, you know, Melody was the inspiration for, for that, that, that tagline, if you will. I love uh, it. But, um, you know, vision. You know, if you remember the stories in the Old Testament, when the, the prophet Daniel had a dream, they called him the vision. So the, the vision of the Warminster Food Bank and the people that that work with the Warminster Food Bank is to eliminate. I mean, this may seem highfalutin or over the top, but it's to eliminate food security in our neighborhood. And when we go out there and we and the mission is the method by which we do it. And the Warminster Food Bank does it in a very, very different way. You know, we don't if you, if you go to other pantries and I'm not saying this in a critical way, but if you go to other pantry, there's a bag or two and it's like, here's your bag. You know, don't starve to death until the next time we see you. But at the Warminster Food Bank, we give a basket that's worth about two hundred and fifty dollars worth of groceries so that we can make a serious impact on their monthly budget. And the basket is very thought out. You know, if there's you know, you talk about Italian food, if there's spaghetti there's sauce to go with that. If there's peanut butter, there's jelly. If there's crackers, there's soup. You know, everything matches with everything as if you were going to eat the food. You know, <laughs> you know. Shocking. We're going to eat uh, this food. So let's make really... it actually a meal that we can eat. You're right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's only so many lima spaghetti. beans. <laughs> there's only so many lima beans and oh. uh, these crazy beans that we get from China. I don't know where they come from. Well, I know they come from China, but uh, we call it Chinese food. Um, but uh, that's the mission to do it differently and to do it in the way that this, that elevates dignity and respect. I told you there was no hunger. We don't like the use of word hunger because I think that's hyperbole in our, in our marketing, but there is a real hunger out there and there's a hunger for people to be treated with dignity. There's a hunger for people to be treated with respect. There's a hunger for people to be treated with caring, cat compassion, and concern. That's the hunger that we serve in our, in our thing. And the passion, the passion comes from the people that do the work. Because quite frankly, Mary Fran, if you come to our organization, you're not going to be able to tell who benefits more by the service work that we do, whether it's the people doing the work or the people receiving the service. You know, we don't call our people who visit us clients, as most pantries do. You know, we call them, we call them guests. They're our guests and they're treated with the dignity and the respect as guests. So the passion comes from the people. And Melody has had did a good job that we're changing things over, but Melody did a good job in identifying people that really needed to be there for their own reasons, to elevate themselves, to strengthen themselves. And to, as Melody likes to say, as to get out of their head and to do other things. And you know what? At the end of the day, they're better for it. They've served, they've served our guests and they've served themselves. And it may sound self-serving, but it's not. Well, it's totally not because one of the things that we talk about in terms of how to live a brilliantly resilient life, if you don't know where your brilliance is, be of service. 
Because when we lead with our hearts, the best of us follows. It always, always does because we're not overthinking it. We're just doing what our heart is telling us to do. And when you do that, you bring this whole set. And I know, Melody, you can speak to this. This whole set of transferable skills that you had maybe in other areas of your life, you bring them with you to that, that passion project. And that's where the best of you comes out. So you can serve others to your best of your ability and you end up serving yourself. So Melody, jump in here and talk a little bit about your experience with taking your transferable skill set that you could no longer use when you were in out of your you know chosen profession and moving it to this space. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you for having me on. Second, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Executive Director Mike Serino. He is a fantastic boss. Actually, he is a boss that in the moment he might think this might be good, but he is that boss that you can go to on a one-on-one and anybody can do it and talk one-on-one. He's open-minded. That's what the world needs to be. Open-minded to easily subject to change in an environment where so many people are closed minded. So I wanted to say thank you to Mike. He's a mentor. He's a father that I never had. Um, He's kind, he's genuous. He brings faith into it. He brings happy and smiles to the food bank. Back to your question. The only thing I can honestly say is um, I hit rock bottom a couple of years ago, meaning I had to focus and realize I wasn't going to be in law enforcement in the career that I worked my butt off. I don't like using, you know, certain things as in like, you know, woman or man and, you know, here and there. I like looking at people as human beings. Me as a human being worked myself up all the way to the highest part of law enforcement you can get as a special agent. Sadly, I suffered a a medical injury that took me to a point where I didn't even know who I was. I, I, I lost myself in the process of all that. I had to find myself because us people, we focus on everybody else out in the world family, friends, work, everything. And we forget about who we are and who we are. We're valuable. We're valuable. And we can bring so much to this universe. And how do you do it? By believing in ourselves, by having self-confidence, by living in the moment, living in the moment, be appreciative of what we have in our bodies, what we have in our minds, what we can gather, what we can build together. One thing I always wanted to say too, I wish we could eliminate the word a need because people are shamed by that word. That's why when I send out any email, I always say neighbors helping neighbors. We're here to help. We're here to serve. We're here to, you know, make, put a smile on somebody's face. It's not that hard, but uh, in regards to where I stand, it's just about somebody has it worse. Mm. If you take our own mindset away from what we're going through and you just take a second for a soldier that lost his leg or somebody fighting in a cancer hospital or a parent losing their child, it, we take our our pity off of ourselves and we put it onto somebody else, which should help us make us feel good. That's how you change your mindset. You know, we're alive. So live, yeah. live. So one of the things that you said here, and I think this circles back kind of nicely to what we're talking about. You talked about your own personal experience of kind of losing yourself and losing your way. And I mean, we all have a vision of ourselves. I'm a this, I'm a that. And it comes through what we've accomplished. It comes through who we are. It comes through where we've gotten in our work lives and all of that th- stuff. But when something happens, you lose that sense of identity. You oh my lose God, yes. that sense of who you are. And I personally can't think of anything more basic and more disruptive to your sense of self than not being able to provide food. Mike, would would you like kind of jump in with that? Because we're talking here about self-respect. I can't imagine that these folks that you that you work with and you help out at the food bank that they haven't lost part of themselves and you're trying to give it back to them. Is that how you see it, Mike, in some way? Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that happens, Mary Fran, when you're working in in this mission is the opportunity to engage with the guests and to talk to them and see what they're all about. And uh, I'll I'll share with you a story that just happened recently. Um, We were at ShopRite with the the Lions uh, doing a food drive and a woman came up to me and said can you help us can you help me because uh, i'm on food stamps now that's called snap now and uh, believe it or not snap is uh, you know supposed to be a great program but uh, it, it probably measures out to about four dollars a day you know mary fran and melody i could make we could make a, 
us about a billion dollars. If uh, and Mary Fran, I know you're an author. You can help me write this book. We're going to write a diet book called Four Dollars a Day. I, you know, people lose millions and millions of pounds because uh, I don't see what what kind of food you can put on the table for four dollars a day. But she said to me, "Can you help me?" And I said, "Yes, we can get you a basket. It's going to be worth about two hundred fifty dollars." And she was visibly moved by that that opportunity. And I said, "I'm really happy I met you today." And she said, "You're happy you met me. You're going to give me a basket for two hundred fifty dollars, and you're happy you met me." I said, "Yeah, take a look around. Take a look at all these people from the Lions gathering up food, and all the people donating. You're doing them a favor because that's what they want to do. They want to be out there, and they want to be a neighbor helping you in in your time that you need help." And she goes, "Well, then she says, well, then in that case." I'm glad you met me as well. So it's like we 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 change we change the paradigm. Exactly. We shift it. Yeah. We, and we, that we and that that is again, it's once again, it's the key here. And you know, as we've become um the world that we currently are, uh, it's it's interesting that we're having this conversation because uh, uh, last week I just interviewed a young couple who um bought a farm much against their own common sense and because they were like we we need to we need to be stewards of the soil. We need to learn, you know, we need to grow food. We need to provide good food. But the, one of the points they made was how the farm and the food source was the center of the community way back when. Like people respected that way more than than they do now. They respected the growing of the food. They respected how it was disseminated within a community. Now, you know, we run into the food store, which is wonderful. We run out, but there's that connection is lost. So the the way that you are are reimagining and shifting that and rebuilding that connection between people and food and our most basic cells, it does serve everyone. It serves those in need and it serves those providing the service. Absolutely. You know, uh, let me just jump in on another point and it had to do with a project that we did during COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I knew I was involved in the food bank for about 25 years before I became director. There's a there's a story about how in the COVID time everybody quit and just kind of left me holding the holding the bag there. But um which is when you got your fancy title, right? Yeah, yeah, we're and my dollar and my dollar. Dollar and, and your uh, raise. <laughs> no, I was actually making more as a recruiter, if you remember. You know, Dave knows I, it. Yes. Uh, but um, I was, we did a project in July of 2020 at the height of COVID. And it was July 25th, 2020. And I was very naive in the sensitivity of, of food insecurity. And so we were giving out these care packages, if you will, that had about $30 worth of food about in it. And I called it Christmas in July. And we marketed the daylights out of it, you know, because people would come and Mary Fran, there was a line from Nativity Church on Street in, where is that street in York Road, mm -hmm. all the way down past Jacksonville. That's and the police oh, said, gosh. you're, you're going to you're going to shut this down pretty soon. I said, when we, when we run out of it, we gave out 12,000 pounds of food that day. Oh. And, uh, you know, that night I got home and my conscience started to uh, assail me. And I said, Mike, Christmas in July, really? This is food. Christmas Food isn't a gift. It's a right. It's a human right. So I, I was humbled by my own arrogance and... Um, you know, my own misunderstanding of what this was about. And I kind of redirected, reshifted myself. So I'm, I'm glad I learned, I'm, you know, I learned lessons. I learned them the hard way, like most people sometimes. But uh, I realized, like I said, the, the sense, I, I became more sensitive. I realized that food wasn't a gift, that it was a right and a, it's not a privilege either. And what we were doing, and again, the people that were serving and delivering those boxes, they were benefiting more than the people that were getting the boxes. I promise you that. I really do. I I have no doubt because like I think one of the things that is missing in this world, um, we're very polarized and we're missing that human connection. And there's no more basic human connection than the, the need than the need to eat. You know, it's food and shelter. That's it. We need food and we need shelter. 
And when we all recognize that, you know, I, I can go in my, my pantry as it is now and in my freezer, and I could probably make food for easily a solid week, if not beyond, you know, and, and, and by that, I mean, meals that I'm, you know, putting in the freezer and all this stuff to your point that, that this is not a privilege. It's not a gift. It's a human right to have that available when we all recognize that and we all bring that perspective, I think it also broadens our minds even beyond what you're doing. Melody, do you think that that might be the case too, that it, it even can go beyond where we recognize each other more as humans? Yes. Yes. And you said something, um, I believe that COVID, uh, did isolation on each and every one of us. And we all have to remember who we were before COVID and go back to who we were. Um, we're not going to be the same, but if we can remember who we are and shine through this dark tunnel and come out on top, everything from food insecurity to mental health to our own confidence and to live every day to the best that we can give. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with everything you guys are saying. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that this conversation has kind of, um, we started with food, but now we're elevating it to the level of human connection. And, and I think that is, again, that's one of the things that we talk about in Brilliantly Resilient. No one's circumstances stay the same. No. The one constant in life is change. No one's circumstances stay the same. So one of the things that we talk about in Brilliantly Resilient is living your value system. And to your point about remembering who we were, I'm I'm not so sure that in some ways we're we're not better off now in some ways because I think people really had to think about who they are and what's really important. So, Mike, would you say that in some ways, in addition to providing this basic need of food, that the Warminster Food Bank is providing almost like a value system for people to live by. Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And again, you know, within, within the people that are there, you know, uh, the, the COVID story, uh, and I know people are probably tired of it, but the, the COVID really did change the whole dynamic of, of how we see each other. There were the best of times, you know, like what was it, Dickens, the best of times and the worst of times. The best of time was the generosity and the caring and the support that we got. The worst of times was the hoarding and the fear and the, the, the suspicions and the, just all the craziness that was associated with it. But, uh, you know, um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns when you're the executive director of the Warminster yeah. Food Bank. You know, I, I, I got some serious hate mail during COVID. One was um, your... Well, how to go, Melody? You're 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 irresponsible, reckless. dangerous, and reckless. Yes. Irresponsible, dangerous because you're spreading the virus. That was 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 the accusation, and I never wrote back. But you know, if I were to write back today, I would say, you know, what's irresponsible? Having thousands of pounds of food and letting it go to waste. You know, what's reckless? Having the ability to distribute that food and not doing it. And you know, what's dangerous? not caring about anybody else that needs help. That's, that's, that's the, irris that's the dangerous part of this. So we had a, we had a re retool ourselves during the COVID, but you know, there was a lot of generosity during that period as well. You know, some organizations we were, Melody and I were at a speech at Rolling Harvest where the, their executive director said they thrived during COVID because Rolling Harvest is a group of farmers that get together. And since nobody was going out to restaurants, all these uh, asparagus and lettuce and everything and all the the arugula and the nice upscale lettuce that you eat at a restaurant that you wouldn't serve to your own family were, were getting, going to waste. And so the farmers had to pick that stuff and it ended up going to the pantry. So there was a boom in that kind of food. So they actually had a boom time during the COVID period. But we had to reposition ourselves. And, uh, and then immediately after COVID, Boom, prices and supply chain, what, you know, what? this isn't a political statement, but it was just the way the supply chain was, you know, things weren't coming in the market the way they should and prices soared. You mm -hmm. know, our, our monthly budget to buy food 
was about seven thousand dollars a month like anything that we don't get donated to us we got to spend an additional seven thousand dollars a month to make up the difference now it's eleven thousand oh dollars so we went from seven thousand dollars to eleven thousand dollars a month so wow. that's how we we had repositioned ourselves and we well i i think one of the things that you you talked about to go back to your to your hate mail um <laughs> outreach is a risk any kind of outreach that you do when you put yourself out there, any kind of outreach is some kind of a risk for the simple reason that you're putting yourself out of your comfort zone. You're entering into, you know, community with people that you might not know. That can be seen as a risk. And I'm doing ear quotes here for anybody who, who's not watching this. But the fact of the matter is that as a community, as the human species, we need community. So every engagement could be looked upon as a risk. So why not take the risk for the greater good? Why not take the risk for helping other people? Oh, Melody's applauding. Jump in here. Tell me what you're thinking. No, I, I'm, I, I am agreeing because your vibe is something that Mike probably will agree with. Mike, there is another person out there in this universe like me. <laughs> I, no, I, I continue. It's beautiful. It, it's, you know, we're, we're all any kind of engagement that we that we embark upon has the risk of not going the way we want it to go. You have to suspend that at a certain point and look at, OK, is there a need here? Can I help? Can I fill it? And to both of your points, not only will you end up perhaps solving a problem or helping someone with a problem, but the way that it increases your worth, your personal worth as a human to engage with the rest of the world, to acknowledge that just because someone is experiencing food insecurity or whatever their issue is, a mental health issue or whatever, they are not less than. It's, mm -hmm. it's just most of this is circumstantial. It's, it's genetic. It's whatever it is. That's not important. What's important is that we answer the call. Yeah. And we also answer the call to ourselves too. Exactly. It, it ends we, up. We have to, ha we have to be, we have to be mentally sound to help others, to listen to others, to provide to others, but we have to be good too. If we're chaotic, we're not going to be good. Exactly. If, we're, if we stay present and in the moment and put well, ourselves to your earlier help. point about getting out of your own head. Again, service to others is not only a way to do that, but it is a way for you to find the best in yourself. So, as much as I would love to talk to you guys for the rest of the day, I'm going to have to wind this up. Mike, I want to know very specifically, how can we first of all find you and what can we do for those folks who are near us in Warminster and for other folks who are not near us, but who are listening to this in another part of the country, maybe in another part of the world, um, what can they do to get involved in mitigating food insecurity in their areas? Well, um, well, thank for thank you, Mary Fran, for this opportunity. And uh, you know, you're you're helping us work on our mission to build awareness for food insecurity. We we thank you for that. Um, you, for us personally, anybody who's interested in our mission, go to www.womensterfoodbank.org. And um, there's a quick quick story about that. You know, there's a Womensterfoodbank Food Bank in England, and a woman a woman from England during COVID accidentally called us and said she needed help. So um, we, was, we weren't going to let a little thing like an ocean stand in our way. So we put together $1,000 worth of uh, donations and sent it to the Warmerster Food Bank in England. So we, we, don't, we don't let oceans even stand in this our way. This is a global community. Global it's a global, a, global, it. a global project. You know, I tell Melody, first, first Warmerster, then the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And look, we're, all, we're with you now, so we're somewhere going. Right. That's there is no limit to the ambition of this and there shouldn't be. So right, I, and, and if people live in the Warminster area. Yes. You know, um, stop by, visit us, see what we're doing, see if there's an opportunity. We all, you know, we volunteer, you know, because, you know, uh, I'm involved in Rotary and Rotary has a slogan service above self. But, you know, I don't like that wording. If you if you say that slowly service above self, it seems like the self is diminished. When you do service, service above self. I like the slogan, service makes you a better self. Oh, I like a that. Better self. Oh, I love self. that. Well, I like Rotary won't let me change their slogan, so we'll just, we'll just <laughs> have to steal it for ourselves. 
I don't but, know uh, if there's anybody that could change it. I have a feeling it might be you two. <laughs> but, but go to womanshipfoodbank.org. And I also saw on your website, and so I want people to be sure to check that out. You do have a list of things that you are in need of. And, and I mean, by that, I mean food products that you're seeking to fill the pantry with. Is that right? That's right. And then that, that changes weekly or every other week because that's a moving target. You know, you know, like things like tuna fish. We, I, 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 there's probably no more tuna left in the ocean. I probably have it all. But uh, other things like um, other like condiments and things like that, they're more difficult. So they go up and down. But uh, we change that week, uh, that list weekly. OK, so everybody in the Warminster area, please check out and you'll have links to all of this in our show notes. Please check out the Warminster Food Bank. Please check out what they are in need for. If you can volunteer, if you can be of service, whether you're local or whether you are anywhere else in the world, I am betting that there are folks around you that are food insecure and need help. So check that out. Mike Serino, Melody, say your last name again so I don't screw it up. It's okay. Letaire. It's Melody okay. Letaire. Both of thank you, you, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for highlighting this really challenging problem, but together I think we can make a dent, if not solve it. So thank you. Check that out. And if you are in need of more brilliance, head on over to brilliantlyresilient.net where you'll be able to sign up for our brilliance bit, which Mike and Melody will be a part of when this episode airs and get your weekly dose of how to live a brilliantly resilient life. We will see you next time on Brilliantly Resilient. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Brilliantly Resilient podcast. Join our Facebook group and follow us on YouTube to be inspired with tools to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance.